our co-host, and I mean solo, today is New York Times bestselling author, the social assassin, John Gilstrap, with one L, by the way. Good morning, John. Good morning. Nice to be here. Hey, I want to start with some good news. A couple weeks ago, we had my friend Jeffrey Deaver on to yeah. do a wonderful interview. And he was talking about his new TV series, Tracker, which has done very well, and it's already been picked up for a second season by CBS. Hi, right, congratulations. So good for him. Yeah. We didn't get a chance to uh, have, uh, have Jeff on when we were hoping to have the because of the Super Bowl. Right. And, and Tracker was supposed to be on after the Super Bowl, but the, the game ran a little longer. Well, it did come on after the Super Bowl, actually. Yeah, nobody and, was awake. Well, <laughs> not on the East Coast. It did very well on the West Coast. <laughs> on the East Coast, nobody could see it. Yeah, I, I was yeah. long since gone yeah. at that time. Right. Right. Were, were you awake to watch it? Oh, it was on no, 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 yeah. no, no. <laughs> yeah. I, and, I, and I recorded it, actually, but when uh, I went to watch the recording, it was actually the overtime from the Super Bowl. Because oh, so it just kept going. But I, but yeah. I did. I, I watched it on demand. I was, yeah. able to, I was able to find it. It's a good show. Our uh, guest in this segment is Nate Kane, candidate for Congress. Earlier this week, we had on Riley Moore, also General Mookie Walker was on the program, too. Nate is another candidate for that congressional seat, uh, currently held by Alex Mooney, uh, who is running for U.S. Senate. Nate, good morning. How are you today? Good morning. I'm doing great. Are you in Washington, D.C.? No, I am not. I actually, uh, they changed my plans. <laughs> so I was supposed to be down there today, and uh, they told me they want me down there next week. So it was kind of a last-minute thing last night. All right, very good. Uh, Nate, uh, you know, I, I can't remember it because uh, I don't, we have talked to you about so many different things. But uh, what do you do for a living now that you're out of your previous job and, and running for, uh, for office? So I have been in cybersecurity for 27 years. Uh, I am a cybersecurity subject matter expert, and um, I have my own company, Kane and Associates, uh, and I have a contract right now uh, with the federal government. All right, so I suspected that's what it was, uh, and I want you to expand a little bit on the situation with TikTok that is currently being considered uh, by Congress, and do you regard TikTok as an actual threat in this country? Well, I think TikTok, as well as several other American-based companies, quite honestly, are a threat when it comes to our personally identifiable information and our data. Um, <clears throat> TikTok, of course, is a Chinese-owned company, although they, they claim that their company uh, has a separation and that the, there's an American um, portion of it that's owned here. And, and this is the real problem. You know, it, it's a it's a interesting case of, you know, where do we draw the line between free speech and, you know, protecting our country? I think when it comes to things like, uh, you know, free speech, I think I'm a, a free speech absolutist. And so I do believe that people should have the right to utilize TikTok if they want and, uh, and to you know, be able to talk on it. And, uh, and honestly, I feel like the threat, you know, for TikTok and trying to gain our data is no different, quite honestly, than Facebook or, you know, any of these other um, big tech companies who honestly oftentimes sell our data. Uh, we don't know who they sell it to, and that includes to our own government in many cases, uh, or they may be selling it to China, or they may be selling it to other companies who are selling it to China. Uh, data, you know, is probably one of the most valuable commodities nowadays. And so you've got... Uh, you know, and I'm learning this even as I'm running for office, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're constantly candidates are constantly looking to buy data so that they know who to, you know, target with ads and things like that. So the the real threat, though, and the real kind of concern I think that uh, some people have is, you know, our phones as we walk around and we carry these phones, you know, they basically are listening devices, they're tracking devices, uh, they're monitoring, you know, where we're, you know, what places we're going on the internet. Um, there's all kinds of evidence that, you know, basically we're walking around with, with these, uh, you know, devices that essentially are, are giving an, an eyesight into or giving ear, you know, hearing into everything that we're doing. And so the question, you know, really the, the responsibility lies with the individual, but the problem is, is that most of the individuals have no idea mm -hmm. the amount of data that is being collected on them. And so what I would be, uh, more for rather than shutting down TikTok or, you know, any other company for that matter is to say, hey, I think there need to be some transparency laws on the book that 
allow us to know what exactly is being tracked, what exactly is being shared, and then if companies violate that, you know, with what they've told us, then, you know, you bring appropriate fines and things like that. You know, the other part of TikTok is the culture rot associated with TikTok. And I, I put that in the context that in China, the TikTok app is restricted to a certain age and up. Sure. And in most of the Western civilizations where TikTok is used, it is permitted to be seen by any age. In, yeah. in China, they won't let an eight-year-old look at many of the videos that are on TikTok. Well, and they're they're very you know I think that's very uh, it's a very smart thing to do because one of the things that has come out about not just TikTok but also Facebook and Twitter and all of these other um, social media apps is that they actually act on the part of the brain uh, that is the same you know response center. Uh, that somebody, you know, is, is uh, accessing when they're using drugs. And so there is an addiction, uh, you know, part to this. And I do think that, you know, that there probably needs to be some good research done. Uh, there probably needs to be some hearings in Congress to talk about this. But as a you know, society, I think we need to really think about this. Do we really want, um, do we really think it's helpful? I mean, certainly there's great things about, you know, about social media. I mean, one of those things is the ability to be able to get news about things uh, that otherwise, you know, it, it allows for kind of getting around the narrative of the mainstream media. And that's a good thing. But one of the things that we've seen is that, you know, you got cyberbullying and things like that that happen with youth. You have, I think, addiction that happens to it. I'm wondering, you know, how this has affected the workforce. I mean, you know, you see it all the time where, you know, you go in somewhere and you see somebody on their phone and they're not really paying attention. I wonder how many accidents occur, you know, due to phone usage and doing, you know, due to games and social media and things like that. Um, I do think there needs to be some research on this. I do think there need to be studies. I, and I think that uh, society needs to make some decisions. Uh, I do think that these kinds of things, you know, it does cross that line of freedom of speech and you know, and where, where, how do we want to restrict and do, should we restrict youth and, and people who are underage? Uh, that's where I do think that there may be some benefit because of the fact that you just have addiction. I mean, we don't allow kids to go into the casino and start gambling. Uh, but, you know, for somebody who's an adult, we absolutely, you know, we're not going to, to try to restrict them. You know, alcohol can be abused. Um, and, you know, we tried the prohibition. Uh, that didn't work too well. <laughs> so... So they reversed on that. So I think for adults, I don't really think you're going to be able to put the, uh, you know, the, the genie back in the bottle. And it may be hard to do that with teenagers as well. But I think parents need to be educated so that they can make better decisions about whether or not they want to allow their child to have access to social media and things like that. John Gilstra. <clears throat> Morning, Nate. Um, I, Morning. I, I want to talk about the phones again a little bit, and then we get on with the what you really probably want to talk about more is about your campaign. But when the... Uh, where does the presumption of privacy kick in? As I walk around with my phone and I'm pinging off the different towers, uh, the fact that I go to this restaurant where I use, you know, Uber, I do that. I that is very marketable, I, I presume, and and I guess there is no presumption of privacy. But then I go to the doctor, or I go to church, or I go to other places. Is there at any point is there a presumption of privacy on the use of this data? Well, there is a presumption of privacy in a couple of areas. So, in the private sector, in the you know in the civilian world, um, I don't think there's a whole lot of presumption of privacy, and I think most people really don't care if somebody's going to target them with ads because maybe they were looking at you know certain things online and, and that you know uh, the things that interest them to buy. For example, you're on Amazon, you're clicking on things. I don't think most people care about that. But where it becomes a problem is when you have the federal government who, you know, is able to essentially bypass and buy that data or gain access to that data without a warrant. And I'll give you a, a perfect case in point. Um, you had, you know, January 6th, of course, you know, that happened. And there was a lot of people. In fact, most of the people down there never even entered into the Capitol building, you know, that were surrounding the building and protesting. There were a lot of innocent people down there who didn't do anything other than just exercise their First Amendment right. And yet, 
we know for a fact that there were multiple instances. There were over 276,000 instances where, uh, for example, the FBI utilized the Section 702 of FISA in order to spy on American citizens. Uh, most of those were related to January 6th. This came out in June, I think, of last year from a federal judge, uh, a tool that was never intended to ever be used on American citizens. And a lot of – and I've made a big deal of this. A lot of other people made a big deal of saying, hey, this has got to stop because it's, a, it's an abuse of our constitutional rights. Um, however, <clears throat> let's say that you did away with that. What's to stop the, you know, the government from targeting you know, Americans uh, that they want to target for whatever reason? And, uh, and them going after and saying, hey, let's go see how many people have, have clicked or have typed in or searched for Donald Trump, you know, on their, uh, you know, on social media. I can tell you right now they're doing this, that this has absolutely happened. And they have identified people on the basis of some of their search history and their likes. And in those cases, they're not using a government spy tool. They're using a tool, uh, you know, a marketing tool. Uh, that was not intended for that purpose for law enforcement. So I think that's where I have major concerns. And that's why, like, you know, even though TikTok certainly concerns me about, you know, what the Chinese are learning about me, the reality is, is I'm more concerned about what my own government has intentions of with these types of tools, because China is an ocean away from me. But, you know, but the Biden administration is right here, right now, spying on American citizens and using tools like this to gather data about people. And I think that's something that should concern us all. So pivoting to that, um, uh, holding the Biden administration accountable, I, in, in preparing for the interview here, I, I see that you have signed on with a letter, I'm not sure what else to call it, um, to hold military leaders accountable for violating their oath of office uh, f- regarding the um, COVID mandate. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So I want to preface this very carefully with the fact that I'm not opposed to vaccines for soldiers that are going into the jungle, for example, and that need a typhoid shot or that need a malaria shot. I think that there are very appropriate vaccines uh, for certain things. This issue specifically relates, though, to the use uh, of a experimental vaccine and the vaccine that was given to our soldiers was not even the vaccine that was approved under the emergency use authorization. It was one that had never even been tested at all. But this is the and one that was that everybody else was taking as well, right? It, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mil- yeah. No, no. So the one in the military was not the one that everybody else took. It was uh, a batch that had never been tested. Uh, it was not approved by the emergency use authorization. So that was the first thing that was kind of a problem. Now, eventually, they did go to the one that was approved under the emergency use authorization. But there was a lot of people who were told, you know, you're going to take this vaccine. Um, <clears throat> that was number one. Number two, uh, there were many people who applied for, um, you know, they applied for religious exemptions. And that is something that, you know, was under military regulations that allow you to do that because of our Constitution had already been adjudicated by the courts to say you have to allow for this because some vaccines are are created using uh, uh, fetal tissue. Uh, you know, it is, they're, they're developed using fetal tissue, and there are people who have, you know, a religious um, prohibition against that. And so uh, there were many people who applied for religious exemptions, and they were wholesalely ignored. Uh, so that was another violation. And then the last thing is, is that under the current rules, within the military, you cannot even use a drug against, uh, you know, against or or use a a drug or a vaccine on soldiers, uh, you know, even under an emergency use authorization, unless it has been approved by the president. And in this case, the president never signed off on that. Uh, The decision was made by Pentagon officials, and and that was not lawful. This was already determined by a, a court um, where that rule came from, I think, like Army Regulation 50, you know, within the Army, I know that the regulation is different for the other services, but where that came from was back in the day when I was in the Army, and uh, they gave me all eight series. Uh, they gave me the, the initial shot and then eight booster shots uh, for anthrax. And in that case, uh, anthrax shot had been around for a while, but it had been not, never been used uh, for people 
for inhalation anthrax. It had only been used for subcutaneous anthrax within the industry for people that worked as uh, sheep shearers and, and some other you know, jobs where they, they may have exposure to uh, anthrax. And <clears throat> there were many soldiers who ended up uh, getting different health problems, uh, you know, what they, they assumed was um, vaccine injury. Uh, you may have heard, you know, maybe remember uh, Gulf War syndrome and things like that. So the the courts decide, you know, this is a, a all volunteer force. You can't use, you know, the military as your guinea pig to test out, you know, what you think might be helpful. You actually have to have, uh, you know, evidence that has to go through the FDA approval process, all of that. So that had already been adjudicated back um, many years ago. And so when they decided to just go ahead and force everybody and coerce our soldiers into taking the COVID vaccine, uh, that is what, you know, that's where they violated the law. And so many of us, uh, there have been many soldiers who were had served honorably. Uh, some of these guys had served for, you know, up to 19 years. And they were kicked out with other than honorable discharge for refusing to take uh, basically for refusing to follow an unlawful order. And uh, there were many guys who were, you know, senior enlisted or officers who said, I'm not going to force this, uh, you know, this unlawful uh, order on my soldiers or on my airmen or Marines or, or seamen. So it, it was a, you know, a choice that they made and they were kicked out. They were denied their benefits. Uh, you know, these guys, many of them were kicked out with other than honorable discharge, over 8,000. Then you had all of the guys who resigned their commissions, uh, you know, because they, they weren't going to do this. And then you had those who who chose to not reenlist, and that 8,000 does not include those numbers. And that's just the, you know, that's just the, uh, the regular army or the regular service. That's not including National Guard and reserves. So it damaged our numbers significantly it put our military um you know in a, a very bad position not to mention all of the wokeness and all the woke indoctrination that's been added into the military as well which is i think hurt our numbers in recruiting uh it's put us in a really bad place uh to where i don't believe the numbers are there for us to be able to fight a two-front war now um and and so we've got some serious problems on the national security front as a result of this as well but more importantly what do we all take the oath you know when we go serve our country, we're taking the oath that we're going to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And we always think about our foreign enemies, but the domestic enemy is tyranny. And what we've seen is we've seen, you know, this, um, you know, the, the COVID vaccine be used in a tyrannical way uh, against American citizens. And the courts have, already, have agreed that, that you can't do these kinds of things. So a perfect example is when they tried to force government employees and government contractors. Uh, I actually was working as a government contractor for uh, the U.S. Navy, um, and I had a, a contract where I was one of the few people trained in cybersecurity assessments against, or cybersecurity assessments on um, submarine weapons platforms. Now, there's not that many people that know how to do it, let alone are certified uh, you know, under the, the Navy Qualification Cert for that kind of work. It's very specific, and yet I was told, uh, you can no longer work here unless you're going to go get the COVID vaccine, to which I said, all right, well, since you want to force that on me, I'm out of here, and I'm starting my own company. So that's what I did. And <clears throat> and this has caused, I think, grave harm and damage, not only to the morale within the military, but also I think it's caused, uh, you know, it, it's, it's basically purged the military of a lot of people who actually had uh, the wherewithal or had the intestinal fortitude to stand up against an unlawful order. And so, you know, it, it's a really sad, you know, sad situation. But what we've made the, the pledge to do in this uh, uh, Declaration of Military Accountability is that we're not going to sit by and, and ignore this. So we've pledged to, uh, to run for office in many cases or to, you know, try to get into positions, um, you know, within the executive branch uh, to be able to affect policy. And um, for those of us uh, running for the legislature, we've made a pledge that we will uh, introduce, Lord willing, we get into office, we will introduce legislation uh, to recall those generals who were involved in those decisions and hold them accountable, uh, you know, call for them to be uh, court-martialed and, uh, and if found guilty, uh, to have their pensions removed. Because if you, you know, if any, anybody else 
you know, committed a felony, you know, while they were in uh, service, you know, and they, you know, they went out, committed a felony, committed a crime, uh, they would get kicked out with a dishonorable discharge, and they would not get their pension. They would not get those benefits. And so I think that the senior, um, you know, level officers, uh, I think that they should be held, you know, to the same standard. And I think that there are many others that believe the same thing. This is not a story I've been following, quite honestly, closely at all. But something in the back of my head, didn't the Supreme Court just fail to or refuse to take this up in, in terms of reinstating the, um, the the military personnel who were let go as a result of this? Um, <clears throat> no. So what happened was they the courts said that they have to reinstate them if they uh, if they ask to be reinstated. Now, the question is, is whether or not um, Lloyd Austin, you know, the problem is, is that there's an argument as to whether or not they should be reinstated with back pay uh, and, you know, and be promoted if they were up for promotion and they lost their, you know, chance for that. And now it's been years. And so most of these guys are like, you know, I'm not doing this. Um, but there's also the other thing that they could do, and I think they need to do, is for those that have been removed on the basis of not taking the vaccine, uh, they need to simply change their, you know, their status, you know, from other than honorable to honorable discharge. And um, I'm not certain of, of a, a, any recent court action, um, you know, like in the last couple of weeks, because honestly, I've been so busy uh, campaigning. Um, but uh, I will look into that and see. But I know that that courts did already adjudicate that they have to uh, allow these guys back in and uh, so so there are some that are coming back in but the problem is is that they haven't made the conditions favorable for them to come back in you know like like i said paying them back pay for their time nate uh, they were separated nate kane our guest candidate for congress and uh nate just a few minutes left here but uh, i want to give you an opportunity to address the U.S. border for Republican voters, it is uh, seems to be the number one issue when polled in regards to the, uh, the security at the border. For Democratic voters, it doesn't seem to be they have other issues. But uh, your thoughts on securing the U.S. border? Well, you know, <clears throat> Trump did an amazing thing when he was in, in that he got Mexico to actually secure their southern border. And it's a much smaller area, you know, to protect. The fact is, is that you know, people can't just fly into Mexico without a visa, but there are countries south of Mexico that they can. And that is a problem because what's happened is you've got massive groups of people that are coming into this country. They're coming through the Darien Gap, which is, you know, this massive section of jungle, um, you know, down there in, in uh, Central, uh, Central America. And that is that's the problem. You have these people that are flying into countries that don't require visas. They're coming up that way. There are two campments right now in the Darien Gap. One of them is for most of your people that are going up uh, from all over the world. But then there's a separate camp, I've learned, that is specifically for Chinese. And there were 35,000 Chinese military-aged men, men that came across our border last year. That should concern us all. Uh, there's so that's one of the issues is, you know, who is coming into our country? Do we even know? Those are the ones that, that didn't get away. Those are the ones that they actually talked to, 35,000. So who knows how many, you know, uh, potential sleeper cells are in our country right now. I'm concerned about that from a national security standpoint. Uh, these could be people who could be used uh, in the event of war, which I think that the possibility of war with China is a real possibility. And, uh, and so, you know, they could be used for sabotage or other things like that. Uh, there's also a, a massive problem at the border that I think you don't hear enough people talking about, and that is uh, fentanyl and its effects. And West Virginia, of course, has been very badly affected by this being, I think, the highest number per capita of people have died from fentanyl overdose. Last year alone in the United States, over 100,000 people died due to fentanyl. Overdose. Now, if you think about that number and you compare it to, uh, say, the Vietnam War, where we lost roughly, you know, give or take, 50,000 American you know, troops in Vietnam over three years, we've lost 100,000 civilians within a year. Now, that said, how do we not look at the situation at the border right now as a war? 
the number one leading cause of death between people between the ages of 18 and 45 is fentanyl overdose. Uh, this should be taken very serious. You know, we, we went to all of this, you know, this stuff to be very concerned about, um, you know, COVID and all of that. But where's the concern about fentanyl? Where's the concern about the lives that are being destroyed, especially the young and productive lives of people who, who should be in the workforce right now? And, uh, you know, it, it's a very big concern. I think, honestly, I look at it like this. We need to send our military down to the border at this point. Uh, we need to be putting sanctions on China because China is supplying the precursor chemicals for creating fentanyl directly to the cartel. You've got companies in China giving those chemicals directly to the cartel, and we should be putting sanctions on them. And then the other thing we need to be doing is we need to shut that border and honestly, we need to be engaging, you know, the uh, and, and I think it should be a cooperative effort with Mexico. But what we need to tell Mexico, you better you know, secure that southern border of yours or we're not dealing with you anymore. We're not going to give you uh, we're not going to you know, allow you to do business in the United States. And that is uh, that is something that I think we have to take more drastic measures at the border. Um, you know, the the not to mention all of this. <clears throat> to me, those are all of the national security threats, uh, you know, that, that are kind of the most concerning. But there are also other ones like the fact that all of these illegals that are coming in to this country that are claiming asylum, uh, they're not following the rules for asylum. They're not doing it in the country. And we've got people coming here from Africa, from Russia, from Asia. From, they're flying to South America and then coming up so that they can seek asylum here. And they violate our own rules. So why are we allowing this? Well, the Biden administration is trying to flood the U.S. What I think, is what they see as potential future, you know, Democrat voters, and and that is a political problem. But it's also a problem for our, you know, for our safety net. You know, what's going to happen is we're not going to have a safety net pretty soon. We're already seeing that up in New York, they've kicked out uh, military veterans with mental health problems that were homeless out of hotels where they were keeping them just so they could move in illegal aliens that have never paid a dime into the system or have never served this country, not one bit. And so that's something that I think is despicable. Uh, it's something that um, this current administration needs to be held accountable for. And, uh, and I, I honestly um, 100% agree with the, the Republicans' uh, decision to impeach, uh, you know, Mayorkas. Um, I think that honestly probably – Half of uh, uh, you know, Biden's cabinet needs to be impeached, including him as president. Nate, how do people find out more about your campaign for Congress? Uh, they can find out more about me by going to Nate Kane, uh, and that's Kane spelled C A I N, Nate Kane for WV.com. And uh, I have pretty much everything that, you know, all the positions that I'm, I'm talking about are, are on there. There's also other things that are going on, too, and I, I highly recommend that people follow me on social media because I don't always have a chance to update things on the page with some of the newer issues that are coming up. There's a lot of kitchen table issues uh, that I've been learning as I've been going out and talking to people around this state, and uh, some of those issues are state issues and maybe not federal issues, but it doesn't matter. The way I look at it as a representative, uh, you can use your campaign or your bully pulpit, if you will, if you get elected to ensure that uh, you're communicating with the state legislature and, and uh, you know, try to fight for those issues uh, even at the state level. So you know, we're working on things like uh, Parents' Bill of Rights that we submitted, that uh, HB 5036, which got uh, read onto the floor, and then it was combined with another Parents' Rights Bill, and now uh, I think it's uh, 4313 uh, passed the House, and it's uh, it came out of committee out of the uh, – uh, out of the uh, Senate uh, Family Committee, and now it's, I think, in the judiciary. So we're working on good things, I think, for the people of West Virginia. And even now, before getting elected, I'm trying to, you know, trying to fight for the people and and, uh, and earn that vote. Nate, have a great day. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you.